Yeah, my name's uh, Joe Bowser. I'm with Adobe, and we're going to talk today about our explorations on using PyTorch Mobile on Android using C++. So I'm with the Sensei on-device team, or Sensei ML Inference and Efficiency team at Adobe. We, we're a, uh, we go across teams and work on, on features. So just to give an outline of what we're going to be talking about today, first it's going to be about PyTorch at Adobe, what we're doing with PyTorch, uh, then, why Android? Why is this talk about Android? Why is this talk about C++? And some findings. And why inference matters, namely on device inference, which may be reviewed from the talk earlier, but this is more from a user, from like an end user context. So first of all, PyTorch at Adobe. So, so we ship a lot of uh, ML models in production today in various products around Adobe. So, so various features of Photoshop, like neural filters, are ML-powered features that we ship. And a, lot of the, and a lot of these features are developed at Adobe Research or with, independent re, or with researchers that are assigned to various product teams. And when we did a survey, we found that the majority of those researchers are using PyTorch. We don't dictate what our researchers use at Adobe. They, can, they have a relative freedom to use what they feel would like, you know, get them published and do their jobs. Um, so we have these models that are being developed in PyTorch, and we have to deploy them in Windows, Mac OS, IO, iOS, and Android, as well as on the web. So when you look at the state of on-device inference in 2022, um, there's desktop. And people don't, generally don't think about desktop, but when you think about a non-technical user, they're not necessarily going to be deploying an entire Python environment and PyTorch and dealing with drivers or that on their desktop. They just want to install Photoshop and have it work. And they want to have it work regardless of whether they're running an NVIDIA GPU or an AMD GPU or no GPU. So we, that's why we leverage the existing tools that are there. And that's why we made the decisions to use things like CoreML on Mac OS, at the time, WinML on Windows, and Onyx runtime on Windows. Um, and on mobile, same situation. You install the app. You want it to run right away. Again, CoreML and TF Lite, and, where you, and we're looked at PyTorch Mobile. And on the web, we're looking at various uh, technologies. It's still experimental. We're still ex we're still looking at the stuff and evaluating it, but there's TFGS and Onyx Runtime. This is sort of generally how things are for application developers looking to deploy ML on devices today. So why is this talk about Android? Now, when, you, when you're actually deploying things on Android, you uh, have numerous choices, unlike with iOS, where you're going to be using something that's using the CoreML backend. It could be PyTorch Mobile, or it could just be CoreML directly. And exporting out of PyTorch to CoreML works. Um, and when you're deploying on Android, you can deploy on what's uh, out there today, like TF Lite, but you could also deploy with PyTorch Mobile or Onyx Runtime. And each of those choices have upsides and major downsides. And if you're just gonna go with what Google recommends, you may actually find yourself facing some serious downsides, namely with model conversion and also with performance, as we found. So the conversion disconnect is this, as we talked about earlier, where you're going from, um, you're going from the PyTorch ecosystem. So you're going from the PyTorch ecosystem and you have to convert it to Onyx, which is this format that's supposed to allow your model to be portable everywhere. Now, when you actually take that model and try and actually port it to places like the TensorFlow ecosystem, things fall apart quickly. And this is partly to do with the fact that Onyx dictates a certain memory management for uh, computer vision tasks. And when you're dealing with TensorFlow, especially TF Lite, they demand the opposite. And there's also the whole situation with different operator support between Onyx, PyTorch, as well as with TF Lite. So while you're able to get the model out in Onyx, getting it into TF is really hard. And um, 
This is the thing that really slows down Android development as well. So yeah, so what if we just don't? What if we instead of trying to do the conversion, just deploy with, Pi with uh, Torch Script and just run Torch Script in Android? That's the, so that was the, that's the promise, and that's sort of one of the deliverables of PyTorch Mobile, is to actually be able to, well, have PyTorch so you can actually do operations on tensors in C++, and actually be able to run Torch Script. So staying in the same ecosystem means that you can leverage everything that, not everything, everything that PyTorch has to offer in C++, which is actually quite a lot. So that's actually something that's really important to uh, keep in mind as well. And also, it does help that the C++ API is similar to the Py Python API. So if, you know, if you're familiar with one, it's not like a huge shock to use the other. So then, because we're talking about Android, why C++? Uh, why? Why are we talking about C++ on Android today? Because typically, whenever you're developing applications on Android, you're going to be using something that compiles to Java bytecode, like Java or Kotlin. So I mean, the reality is that Adobe loves C++. We'll compile C++ literally anything. Um, and we have a lot of C++ talent. Uh, we have a lot of, um, of uh, code that we have that uh, written in C++ that we don't want to rewrite in other languages because it we just couldn't. Um, it would take too long. And the thing is that we also want to make sure that we can take that C++ and have it portable across Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android. And you could do that in C++. And also port it to the web through Wasm. And you can do that. And that's something that you can't do as easily with other languages, especially in the iOS space trying to get it to work with Objective-C and Swift. Um, and also, there's the other thing where you can't, when you run C++ on Android, you have to deal with the, the Java native interface, the JNI layer. And if you're going across the JNI layer over and over again, not only does that if, affect uh, speed, which it doesn't affect speed a lot, but it can add up if you're doing a lot of operations. And it also affects uh, Stability, like you can have bugs, you can have objects that sort of drift if you're not careful. And it's easy to keep as much of your business logic, like the actual things that are doing your image processing and running your models and doing all that in C++ as much as you possibly can. So that's our logic. And pre and post. So yeah, not everything's ImageNet based. So there is some pre and post in, um, in the various Java based platforms. But it's mostly, OK, we have something trained on ImageNet, do, do normalization. It's been, done, it's been done numerous times. But I have two examples that I'm going to show that actually don't have, that don't use ImageNet. They, you, you do other things, like one is grab, a, one is sample it in a different, uh, instead of RGB, Y, C, B, C, R, C, B, and the other one is just multiplying and dividing a tensor. Um, and then there, the another thing we have to concern ourselves about is, you know, copying stuff. So what we do for a pre and post when we're actually op operating a feature, because remember, when we don't have PyTorch, we don't have PyTorch. So we have to, like, grab something else. And unfortunately, that means OpenCV at the time. I'm not going to say anything bad about OpenCV, because it's great for having the APIs be similar, but it does complicate things, because then we have to take that and adopt it for our own internal stuff, which is different. Or if someone's, do, or if someone's choosing to use Halide in C++ for it, we have to use Halide. I would have used Halide's logo, but I couldn't find it. So sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so, and then there's the knowledge gap. So one thing that we have to deal with at Adobe is that we have our researchers. And they're really good at writing Python and writing papers and doing a whole bunch of PyTorch dev, but they're, they're not so uh, good when you ask them, when they ask how can I help you, like, do you know C++ code? Can you, like, and they, they'll just, their eyes will glaze, and you'll just be like, all right, cool. Uh, 
and then there's also the, uh, the reality is when you're trying to tell software developers, like I myself, I'm actually, like my background isn't ML at all. It's mobile development. Like I come from like open source and mobile development for like a decade before I started with ML at Adobe. And uh, like I didn't know what the difference between planar and chunky or interleaved and non-interleaved. And this is like a major concept that's actually really important, especially when you're talking about model conversion and actually deploying the things, and as well as performance. And this is an universal nomenclature. Like I'll ask in an interview, for example, hey, uh, can you tell me the difference between planar and chunky? And then they'll be like, what? And I learned that from the gaming industry. A lot of other people talk about this in different contexts. And that's why it's important to have everyone on the same page and ideally using the same tools. So, um, yeah, and ideally you want things to be, you know, to be uh, similar. So this is some Python code in OpenCV to do some pre and post, and that's the same thing. And in PyTorch, which I, you can actually do something similar to this. Now, I, we're gonna get into the next thing, which is why does this matter? Why, well, what did I find when I actually compared these frameworks at Adobe? Remember, I'm trying to figure out whether we should adopt PyTorch Mobile and ship it in a product. And, um, and what my recommendations are and whether it's a good idea or not. So why does this matter? And it matters because PyTorch is PyTorch. It's easier to work with. And I think it handles GP pretty well. Like, like you don't have to do this sort of weird, clunky delegate thing that you do have to do with other frameworks where you're just like, where you have to set up a session and load something and it may or may not exist. You can just sort of, it's sort of more like how it works with CUDA where you could just ask PyTorch, hey, does this work? And it'll tell you if it does or not. And that's actually really great because you can also know where that tensor is located in memory. That's actually critically important because copying between CPU and GPU memory is one of our bottlenecks. And we can actually, and if we actually know where, where it is in memory, we can actually grab it off the GPU and keep it on the GPU when we're dealing in Vulkan, and that's huge. So he, again, this is an example of like setting up a tensor in PyTorch Mobile and setting it to channels last and then doing inference, like calling forward. If you've seen the, um, if you've seen like pretty much any basic model in PyTorch, it looks very similar, right? So that's the thing that's really important with this, is that the similarity, the fact that even though it's a different language, the same core concepts are consistent. And that's, like the, that's one of the big things that I think makes it a really promising tech. So here, I'm gonna talk about use cases. So this is where I've actually wrote some demos and tried to get things running head to head. So I've actually taken the, the big uh, three that are on Android and put them head to head. So this, so there's actually a tutorial on how to convert to Onyx on the PyTorch uh, site. And it has this really simple five, five or six layer, I believe it's five layer super res model. And it just scales a cat image up. So the beauty is that I can convert this to all three so I could actually do a proper apples to apples comparison and which is actually really hard to do because of the conversion step and actually getting a model from PyTorch everywhere, um, which is another reason why PyTorch mobile is great, actually, uh, is that we can, but well, here we're doing the apples to apples comparison, and this is just, I think it's literally just doing convolution and pixel shuffle or depth through space. And as we're seeing, PyTorch, like the lower bars are better, and they're color coded based on branding colors, um, PyTorch Mobile easily beats TensorFlow, like TF Lite on Android. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't do Vulkan because this model only has one channel, but okay. And it's just barely beaten out by Onyx Runtime. This is the only time we'll see Onyx Runtime because I couldn't get it to run with the other models. 
And this is MobileNet V2. This is probably the most common architecture deployed in mobile today. Uh, and I gave, I gave it four threads. I probably could have gave it eight thread. Nah, that would have been, four threads is generally standard uh, for TF, but, and on NNAPI, they basically run the same. There is some setup of PyTorch, but once you run the setup, they run the same. There's like less than a, like maybe half a microsecond difference. And this is on 25 runs. I've done it on 100 runs. Same sort of results. And yeah, with GPU, I couldn't get this to run together on GPU, unfortunately, because each framer competes. But it's a very, but this is something that you could actually download and build. And once you get the models in, get it on your phone and see straight up in real time. Yeah, we're actually, like, it's actually better. Like, and the final one is, uh, I just, so this is more like a demonstration of how we would use something that's similar to what we would use at Adobe. I can't act, of course, because our models are proprietary, I can't actually like deploy them in my demos. That's not allowed. So I had to find some random GAN off the internet. So I found Anime GAN. So Anime GAN is, you know, a GAN model. And it, um, it takes six seconds, roughly, on, uh, on my Pixel 6. And um, it took, like, three seconds. Actually, no. Maybe three seconds, four seconds on, uh, on Onyx Runtime. So Onyx Runtime was a little faster, but not really. And I couldn't get it to, come, I couldn't get it to work at all in the, in the other framework. Um, it took 30 seconds, overheated the phone, had a gray image. Um, it can't run an NNAPI at all due to memory constraints. So like when you're talking about more complicated models, GPU becomes more important. But something else that you have to remember is that you need your GPU to do things like draw your UI. So if I was actually doing a real app, I probably would do CPU in the background. Or I'd be leveraging the uh, neural, the uh, the neural API more, just because I don't want jank in my UI. And yeah, again, this was just something I did sort of to more demonstrate what a typical Adobe model would be, like something that you would find, say, Photoshop. This isn't a Photoshop model. This is a random, again, random model I found on the internet. But that is the point of that. So in conclusion, PyTorch performance numbers are comparable to competitors, if not beating them straight up. Off the, and the main advantage, the thing is, it's not just about performance, it's not just about conversion, but it's actually having PyTorch there. So if you need to actually do some math on a tensor, you can. If you need to actually like, do some things where chaining it between two models, you can. And it, it works in a coherent, consistent way you know, between Python's API and C++'s API. And that's, that's the thing that I find the most valuable as far as getting velocity and being able to explain exactly what you're doing, at least for someone who has to port models and actually take stuff and move it to device for productization. And that's actually something that's really hard today because sometimes your memory layouts are weird and sometimes you can't do the pre and post processing step or it's really expensive. So that's pretty much it for what I have. So here's uh, the links to the repositories. This is my personal repo um, that has these demos. Uh, this is li License Apache 2.0. Uh, all open source demos that are done through Adobe are generally licensed under the Apache software license due to you know, how we open source things at Adobe. Um, to get the model, there is a included Jupyter Notebook. What it does is uh, it, it allows you to convert it to CPU and GPU. Uh, to use GPU, you need to have the Vulkan, um, you need to have a local build of PyTorch installed, and it needs to have the Vulkan backend enabled. Uh, and it can't be a Docker. It actually has to be a legit full backend. Uh, I, I have to actually file and fix that because I actually, I might have a fix for that, but I can. So that's the great thing about being a part of foundation. And 
that's it. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Raghu now. <laughs>